Hare Krishna. Welcome to the Bhagavad Gita class. We will get started now. Is the audio still clear? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, as we discussed last time, we will start with Mangalacharan prayers. These prayers are to invoke auspiciousness, to invite the mercy of or the blessings of previous acharyas and gurus so that we can understand this topic of Bhagavad Gita nicely. If Bhagavad Gita is understood nicely, then we have made great progress in our spiritual life. Um, Bhagavad Gita or in our uh, Sanatana Dharma, there are considered to be three main pillars of philosophy or core understanding of Sanatana Dharma. What is uh, the foundation of everything that we do at a spiritual level? And those three textbooks are Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads and the Vedanta Sutra. And among these three, Bhagavad Gita is the one that is directly spoken by Sri Krishna uh, to his devotee Arjuna. So, um, Bhagavad Gita is, again, I wouldn't say any one of the three is more important than the other. All are equally important. But Bhagavad Gita is very, very paramount in understanding what spiritual uh, progress is all about in one's life. So, um, understanding Bhagavad Gita gives a excellent foundation for making spiritual progress. And our uh, Acharyas, our Gurus, uh, have a great role to play because they have explained the Bhagavad Gita, the meaning of the Bhagavad Gita, very nicely. And therefore, it behooves us to request their blessings so that we can understand what they are trying to tell us. I will share my screen. And uh, yeah. So here, once again, the website is vedabase.io from here you can go to the Bhagavad Gita the entire Bhagavad Gita that we will be reading is available here the prayers that we will recite in the beginning are in the introduction it includes the Sanskrit in IAST format if you don't know what that is you can review the previous class and um, the meanings are also given we went over the meaning of the first verse Sometime, some other time, we could go into the meanings of the other verses, but we don't have the time right now to do that. But I request all of you to read the meanings of every verse. Understanding the meaning is very, very important. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's it's not that much beneficial to just recite some words that you are reciting without understanding absolutely anything what it is. And for most people these days, uh, Sanskrit is becoming more and more extinct. So... Um, Understanding the meaning is very important. Uh, another point I just want to make for everybody that is listening, uh, or, you know, I'll make this point again when more people join. Ask your questions in the class. I get a lot of questions on WhatsApp or later after everybody has dropped. Uh, you know, please ask it during the class. It does two things. One, it, it helps me to, I am focused, I am we have dedicated this time for discussion uh, and uh, I miss questions on WhatsApp. Some people say, oh, I have sent you the question on WhatsApp, but you never replied. Yes, that is true. Uh, so please expect delayed responses or no responses on WhatsApp, individual messages that are sent. This is the best time to ask questions. So please ask. And the second thing is your question may help many others. So you're first of all guaranteed a response because we are talking live, one or, I mean, in a live or a session. And the second point is uh, others may benefit. Yeah. Okay. So with that, 
and you can raise your hands right now i have removed permissions for you to unmute later on as we get more tuned we will i'll allow that but you can raise your hand and i will stop at appropriate moments and you know do q and a having said that let's start with the prayers om gyan timirandhasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupaha Kadamahyam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yutapadakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Scha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Preshthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakal Patarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavani Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advai Gadadhara Shrivas Adi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Bhagavad Gita ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. All right. <coughs> so, any questions before we begin? And keep your hands raised. If you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'm not going to wait for questions to come up. Okay. So, moving on, we will, let me share the slides. Okay, so last time we uh, could not start chapter one, so we are ch starting chapter one today. And uh, we did the orientation, the introduction, the main topics of Bhagavad Gita, and we discussed many uh, nice things about Bhagavad Gita. So now let's dive into the Bhagavad Gita. So all this was discussed last time. So, chapter one, observing the armies. Now, before we begin, I am expecting all of you who want to, to derive that maximum benefit to have the Bhagavad Gita with you in your hand as we are going to go through the class. That is the best way to attend the class. Uh, you can have a device also and look at Veda base, but you know, a pop up may come and you can get distracted. So, uh, a paper copy is best. Okay, so observing the armies that is the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Now, there are 700 verses in the Bhagavad Gita, we'll try to go through them uh, as you know, in a timely manner. So we will not focus on the Sanskrit and the, or even the English translation of every single of the 700 verses. Especially for Bhakti Shastri students, I want to mention very uh, clearly that you must go through the Bhagavad Gita or all the books, basically. Uh, you must read the, the verses, the synonyms, which is the word by word translations and the, pur the translations and the purports for each verse. Uh, so please uh, do that on your own. Okay, are you raising your hand? There is a feature to raise hand in Zoom. Please try to learn how to use that. But for now, I got, I saw you. Yes, what's your question? You're muted. I have asked you to unmute. Why Bhagavad Gita was written? 
why Bhagavad Gita was written. We will cover that. Thank you. By the end of this class, if it is not clear, then you can ask again. And lower your hand after your question has been addressed. Okay, I lowered it for you. Okay. So, uh, before we get into the chapter itself, actually this may be, I don't fully know the context of this question that why Bhagavad Gita was written, but let's try to address some pieces of it. So the chapter name is Observing the Armies. So army means there is a war or something is going to happen with an army. So let us see what is the scene of the Bhagavad Gita. What caused the Bhagavad Gita to be spoken at this present moment or in this present situation? So I am assuming many of you or all of you are familiar with the scene of the Bhagavad Gita. So I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I just to do enough amount of justice, I will uh, say just a few words. So Bhagavad Gita was spoken by Lord Shri Krishna to his very dear disciple, friend uh, Arjun on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Between this war, it's almost like a world war because every kingdom, every king, every army on, on the planet was involved in this war, had taken the sides with Kauravas and Pandavas. They were cousins and basically there was a, a very strong animosity between them, primarily from the side of the Kauravas. They were the evil side or the bad guys, as you would say, and the Pandavas are the good guys representing all the good qualities. But the Kauravas, since childhood, were unable to tolerate the Pandavas and were um, made many, many attempts to uh, kill them. Uh, and finally, after a long sequence of events, uh, it came down to having a war to decide who gets to stay and who gets to vanquish. That's what it comes down to in the, and that's when Bhagavad Gita was spoken at the beginning of this war or this, and you can see that little picture there. Now, there are many, many, and in the Bhagavad Gita, as it is, um, there is a chapter or not a chapter right after the table of contents there is something called setting the scene so Srila Prabhupada who is the uh, commentator on the Bhagavad Gita of this edition that we are going to read Bhagavad Gita as it is now today I have a different copy it does not have a yellow color it has a blue color but this is just the older cover the inside contents are exactly the same so there is a chapter called Setting the Scene. You should read that to get more details if you are not familiar. Now, many people ask many background questions. Now, this goes a little bit into the details of the Mahabharata. And I will just throw up these questions here. And if any of you have these questions, you are welcome to ask by raising your hand. I am interested in so-and-so question, so-and-so question, so-and-so question. Very briefly, this whole Mahabharat started at the... One may think that Arjun or Duryodhan are the main characters, the hero and the villain, so to say. But the story starts way back with Dhritarashtra. And he was born blind. Even though he was the elder brother, he was not given the throne because a blind person by law or rules of that time was not eligible to sit on the throne. So the younger brother Pandu was made the king. This is where all the, the grudge started. And 
once Pandu is king, then his son is entitled to the throne. Also, as it happened, Gandhari, who is the wife of Dhritarashtra, was not having children. And after it is again, you know, I don't want to go into the historical details in Mahabharat, but Yudhishthir was born first to Kunti, who is the wife of Pandu. And between Yudhishthir and Duryodhan, Yudhishthir is the elder one. This also greatly uh, disappointed, impacted, destroyed Dhritarashtra. He was very much trying that he should have the elder son so that maybe through some argument he can say that my son should become the king because he's elder. So first of all, he was not king plus his son wasn't the eldest due to a turn of events. So for Dhritarashtra, fate or destiny was conspiring against him. And he was full of uh, anger and a mentality of revenge. But he does not know who to take revenge against. How do you take revenge against destiny? You were born blind. Who will you revenge it from? You were trying, but somebody else got their child first before you. How do you take revenge against that? So all this started and this seeped into this consciousness was very much seeped into the mind of Duryodhana. And this is a very complex um, um, situation. And if you read the Mahabharata in detail, it's, it's very, very heartbreaking and yet eye-opening how uh, Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan kind of lived their life with what priorities, with what morals, how the father looked to the other side when the son was doing so many bad things. All this is there. And the other one of the questions is, why not just divide the kingdom? We are having this Israel-Palestine war, two-state solution. So everybody says two-state solution. So as per the Vedic system, you cannot keep dividing the kingdom. Imagine after five generations, there will be 25 small kingdoms because from one you come to two, then they will have, let's say, two children and they will divide it into four, then eight, 16. You know, after four generations, you will have like, you know, time. you cannot have a large empire a kingdom and there is strength in unity of the whole empire. So there has to be a rule or a way in which a king is appointed and others have to agree with it. You cannot just say we'll just divide it into two. So all these are to be taken into account. People just say, oh, why didn't they just... And actually, the situation became so bad that at one point, Dhritarashtra did divide the kingdom into two. Hastinapur was the capital or the name of the you know por portion that was retained by Dhritarashtra and Indraprastha was given to Yudhishthir to rule said okay you be happy you know when you know two brothers fight then father says okay you both live in your separate houses you know if you can't stay under one roof so even that happened and there also they tried to cheat. They gave like a barren land completely where nothing grows. There was nobody living there. It was a complete desert. It was given to rule to Yudhishthir. And uh, out of their good qualities, they converted Indraprastha into a very prosperous land and made it much better than Hastinapur. That made the Kauravas so jealous and then they came up with this whole plan to take away everything from them then the whole gambling match was and they, yeah there is another important question why did Yudhishthir gamble 
gambling is bad. Today you go to a casino in Las Vegas to gamble. They don't force you to gamble. You can go around and watch other people gamble, but you don't have to. And one can ask, did we talk about this last week? I somehow feel I was telling somebody this thing recently. And I don't want to repeat myself in this class. Did, did we? Anyway, okay, so people are telling me no. So it is not that Yudhishthir was itching to gamble and he was like, you know, wanting to do that. If you read the Mahabharat carefully, and this is a portion that I have read very carefully, he is obligated to gamble because, or it's not a gamble, it's called a gambling match. It was a, it was a, it was a match, a game, like we have the Olympics or whatever. If you, if you, you know, you, you're um, being asked to play the game, whether it is a game of dice or a game of chess or any board game. And Yudhishthir uh, was asked by Dhritarashtra. It was on the order of Dhritarashtra that the game was organized. And he was invited to play the game and he had no uh, place to say no. It was not the conduct of a Kshatriya to say no. You would rather give up your life than to say no. So that was the situation. And before and as he was losing, as you all may remember, he lost his kingdom, then he lost his personal property, he lost his brothers, he lost his wife, Draupadi, and then she was almost, you know, disrobed and so brutally treated. Uh, every time, before every throwing of the dice, he was saying, I do not want to play. Please stop this. Please stop. And the only person who had the power to stop it was Dhritarashtra, and he was silent. If you read the Mahabharat, before every throwing of the dice, Yudhishthir was saying, why are you compelling me to do this? So people who may say, why did he have to gamble? They don't understand the, the situation or the dynamics. And I just want to make sure everybody understands that it's not just out of some stupidity or our great kings of, of the time were, weren't stupid that they, uh, you know, or weren't like just, you know, sense gratifying jerks oh let's gamble and let me you know put my wife on the on the bet and you know have her disrobed uh, it sounds very stupid or very idiotic or ridiculous today but that's not the case i just wanted to point that out why did duryodhan deserve to die People may remember only that he tried to disrobe Draupadi. Well, that's very, very serious, first of all, in public. I mean, it's worse. Please understand, it's worse than today's situation. Have you ever seen a woman being disrobed in the parliament? In may, it may happen in the private quarters. Maybe Bill Clinton did it in, in, in his room, whatever, but not in the Capitol Hill, right? Who knows? So uh, it's worse than today. Please try to understand what happened. Plus, there were so many attempts on the life of the Pandavas by the Kauravas. They tried to poison them. They tried to drown them. They tried to kill them in a fire. They burnt the house where they were sleeping all kinds of things. They were attacked, they were cheated. So it's not just one thing. It's And Dhritarashtra, the father, was completely complicit in all these things. Okay, all these questions, I think I'm going way off script here. So uh, we'll proceed further. I have a lot of stuff to cover. Finally, why did Bhishma and Drona are on Kaurava's side? Now there were um three people and i would yeah i will just say three i was going to say three and a half but mainly three people who were always trying to put some sense 
into Dhritarashtra. Two of them are mentioned here, Bhishma and Drona. And the third person is Vidura. Now he took off before the war. He knew it was a hopeless situation, so he just went on a pilgrimage. These two were stuck and out of, again, the conduct, the certain obligations they had to fight for the Kauravas, even though their heart was fully with the Pandavas. And they just said, you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll martyr ourselves. They knew that they will lose. The good always wins over the evil, and they knew who is good, who is evil. So anyway, long story short, that's the that's the point. Okay, Arnab, what is your question? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hare Krishna Prabhu. I had uh, one question about Mahabharata in general. Is that, uh, as we understand all the atrocities that has been done from the side of the Kauravas, Dhritarashtra, etc. But in terms of what Pandavas, the, how their life has been, have do you think there has been mistakes from their side too in anything? Or they are, are they characters of grey? Or are they actually white and what they did was all righteous? Thank you. And I don't want to do a surgical analysis here. We do not have the time. But in general, they were very, very pious and very moral. And especially Yudhishthir, there were times where Bhima would get very angry and Yudhishthir would calm him down. And one great thing that all the brothers had, the four brothers other than Yudhishthir, is that they were completely surrendered to Yudhishthir. His word was absolutely final. And uh, that was putting all five under the same uh, mood as Yudhishthir. And Yudhishthir was definitely the most righteous person. He's known as Dharmaraj. So he did not commit anything wrong. Even till the very end, he was the most, it's like, if you read the character of Yudhishthir, you will not imagine, you cannot imagine how such a person can exist. Um, the kind of things that he did. Respecting Dhritarashtra, even after the whole war was over, treating him like a father. Every morning he would get up, go visit Dhritarashtra and touch his feet, ask his blessings. After the war was over and Yudhishthir had been crowned king. After winning the war, Yudhishthir did not want to become king. He said, let Dhritarashtra become king. Back again. He was the eldest. And some sense prevailed into Dhritarashtra and he said, no, 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 you become king. So he was even willing to make Dhritarashtra king again. So again, I hope that answers that question. Okay. Okay, now let us go into chapter one. A quick summary of chapter one we will do. So, and then I want to discuss in the next slide the significance of chapter one. Now, many people... So, let me first give you a very quick summary of chapter one. It has 46 verses. It can be roughly divided into four sections as shown here. The first section is the descript is a description of Duryodhan's army. So the war is about to begin and the description of both armies are given of the Duryodhan's army and Pandava's army. And then a turn of events begin to occur. So, so far it's okay till verse 19 things are going as normal. 20 onwards, things begin to turn. Arjuna somehow gets this thought in his mind. I want to see my opponents. Just to get a glimpse before the war starts. And he requests Lord Krishna to draw the chariot in the middle of the armies. 
And in the last section, and then when he begins to see the other side, of course, he already knew it's not that it's a surprise to him that who is on the other side. But when the moment of truth comes, and please realize the conch shells and the bugles have already been sounded in the first 19 verses, you will see both sides, which means that the official declaration of war has occurred. In the temple, for example, when Arti begins, a conch is blown. It is the indication that the official proceeding has begun. If you were sitting down, you are expected to stand up and do the uh, participate in the Arti. So it is an indication of official beginning of proceedings. And both sides sound their conch shells. That's a big part of these two sections, first two sections. So, and then it's a grace period. The other side is now waiting that this guy, they are looking at this guy, Arjuna. He is coming in the middle. They are wondering, like, is he like just going to like, what, committing suicide or we'll just finish him in two seconds? Why is he detaching himself from his army and just coming? They say, okay, let's wait and see what's going on. And then the conversation between Krishna and Arjun begins. So it's all a grace period. So please try to understand that this is the moment. Now there is no going back. And that is the time when Arjuna gets cold feet. Literally, he gets cold feet. His arms begin to shiver. He says he cannot even stand. He is falling down and he sits down. And then 28 to 46, verse numbers 28 to 46. How many verses is that? Uh, whatever. Uh, 16, 17, 19 verses. Arjun says the unthinkable that I cannot fight. And that is the first chapter. Okay. So usually in the previous batches of Bhagavad Gita that we have done, I reserve five minutes or seven minutes to just read through the translation of all the verses. I am debating whether to do that or is it a redundant exercise and you have all done it. I can't say. Many of you are, I can see from the Zoom, are already very familiar with sort of the general flow. So I will, I'm thinking I will skip that just reading through the verses. I expect you from future to come to the class at least having read the translations of all the verses of the chapter we are going to discuss. At a minimum, if you can read the purports, that's even better. Coming prepared to class, just like your school. I see a lot of youth here, which is very encouraging. And all of us have been youth. You can't become older without being a youth or going to school. So teachers always say, you know, read the textbook before coming to class. It's a good practice. Same thing here. So I'm, unless you all tell me in the Q&A or so whatever that we should read the verses, I'm going to skip that. And But we will cover important points. So, having said that, let me go over some important points in, the, in these sections as we go along. Okay, then uh, Shrikar has a question. Yes. Hey, Krishna Prabhu. Um, uh, since we were sort of on the topic of Mahabharat, but we'll never, we'll probably not come back to that for the rest of the class. I just wanted to ask this question as a means to like, you know, just ask this question before it becomes out of topic. Um, so it's said that the Pandavas are very good devotees of like very serious devotees of Krishna. Um, but do we have any insight into their sadhana? Because I know the Yuga Dharma for Dwapar Yuga was deity worship. Um, 
but we don't really i read the mahabharat like several times and i've never seen any insight into them actually performing their sadhana like we have sadhana in kaliyuga like you know performing the nine process of devotional service uh but you are, i i guess you are part of bhakti shastri which is good very good and when we will reach uh bhakti rasamrita sindhu which is the last book we will cover the most advanced one you will understand that there are two processes of sadhana bhakti one is vaidhi sadhana bhakti and one is raganuga sadhana raganuga bhakti oh. and so what we can surmise is that the pandavas were raganuga bhaktas they were so attached to shri krishna what is most important shri rupa goswami and and stay unmuted if you want to ask a follow up okay till 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 the q and a is done yeah. because if you unmute if you lock yourself in mute kind of then it i have to give you permission to unmute i, I just realized yeah, yeah sorry yeah. thank you no problem so uh, um the most important statement made by shri rupa goswami in bhakti rasamrita sindhu is tasmat kenapi upayena manah krishna niveshayet and there's stuff before it and tasmat means therefore now this is another learning tip for everybody who's reading bhagavad gita whenever there is the word tasmat or atah both of these words mean in sanskrit therefore and anything that wherever you see this word your red flags should go up or your ears should become attentive that something important is coming it's like a conclusion it's like a important verse so lord uh, shri rupa goswami is quoting from shrimad bhagavatam 7th canto first chapter narad muni is having a conversation with yudhishthir coincidentally where he says therefore kenapi upayana was somehow or the other invest your mind in krishna that is the highest level of bhakti all these nine processes etc are the sadhan are the means after the sadhan comes sadhya sadhan is the process of attaining the sadhya sadhya means that which is to be attained so pandavas are already at a sadhya level okay so they're just in constant smarnam which is like... yeah, they are constantly they are constantly in thought of krishna so they don't have to you know carry around a bead bag or yeah do all those things so you know in a way they're really fortunate to or i don't know if i should say i mean but they they were in the they have reached the sadhya stage they have reached the sadhya stage yeah they are the nitya siddha devotees so they are okay. perfected beings and they have come so, down okay. along with shri krishna to participate in his pastimes okay okay good question thank you bro yeah. lower your hand and mute yourself thanks okay so we'll go over quickly some of the points in in the first section description of duryodhan's army so in the very first verse itself it says dharma kshetre kurukshetre samaveta yuyutsavah mamakah pandavashchaiva kim akurvata sanjaya so this is the only verse that is spoken by dhritarashtra and one part of the scene here is that dhritarashtra is being narrated the the entire mahabharat by his loyal servant sanjaya so he is asking sanjaya what is going on and sanjaya has been given divine vision by uh, maharshi vedavyas to see what is going on he was willing to give vision directly to dhritarashtra but dhritarashtra said if i if you give me the power to see i won't even recognize who are my children who are pandavas who is who i am so attuned to hearing about people rather than you know i have never seen anyone so give this vision to my servant sanjaya he will nicely explain to me what's going on my ears are my eyes 
So this is the reason why Sanjay is narrating the whole thing to Dhritarashtra. So Dhritarashtra is asking Sanjaya, Mamakaha Pandavashchaiva Kim Makurvata Sanjaya. What's going on? Kim Makurvata. What did they do? They means who? Mamakaha. My children and Pandava's children. Pandava's And you can see here itself, this mood is there always in Dhritarashtra. My children versus Pandu's children. He, please remember, he is the younger brother, Pandu, of Dhritarashtra. He died because of natural whatever. He had a curse and so many other things. We won't go into deeper history. But he died and Dhritarashtra said at that time to Kunti and that Pandu's children, I will, I will treat them better than my own children. More dear, they will be more dear to me than my own children. He, he pledged that. But he never fulfilled that pledge. His whole mood was, and we will go into this aspect. So please remember, there is there's a very important point here. Well, let me say it here. The biggest thing about Bhagavad Gita, in the beginning at least, is all about attachments. Our attachments. And how much, what great distances people who are attached to other people will go to, to care or to show their affection or just to just out of attachment to do things for their loved ones. And here we will see a father is so attached to his son that he will ignore blatant crime and he will, he will just take sides left, right and center. This, this Dhritarashtra character is just immersed like dipped like you know in a syrup of attachment so you will see that you know in in him and that's why he's saying and there are significant there's significance to other words dharma kshetra and purukshetra is dharma kshetra so obviously dharma will prevail and yeah there are more things here now duryodhana is going around and uh, he is very confident about his power. So that is another part of the attachment. We will. I have slides and bullets to talk about it, his power. The kind of people that are working for him, that have pled pledged allegiance or loyalty to him. Bhishma. There is absolutely no one in the whole world who can defeat Bhishma. So when we are talking about this, this thing, please try to understand the gravity of some of these situations and characters. It's not your ordinary army general. Bhishma is somebody who is undefeatable, literally undefeatable, single-handedly he could have defeated the entire army. He didn't need an army. Same thing for Drona. Dronacharya. Almost the same thing for Karna. Karna was a better archer than Arjuna. Technically, just technically. And... He was the other, the three and a half, I said. He has a split character. Sometimes he talks morally and sometimes he is a complete rascal. He was the one who agreed, went along with Duryodhan and Dushasan to say, yeah, yeah, bring along that maidservant, Draupadi. Now she is our maidservant. Let her sit on the lap with all her clothes removed. Like that, he was he was encouraging very, very bad behavior. Whereas on the other hand, when they were trying to kill the Pandavas by, by burning the house, Lakshagraha, if you know what I'm saying, Kauravas, uh, Karna said, why are you doing this? Let's fight them straight in battle. Why we have to kill them by this, you know? Uh, why we have to assassinate them by, by this uh, means? So Karna is also a very complex character. Anyway, so all these people are, are in 
Kauravas army are, are for Duryodhan. Victory is guaranteed. Here comes a very important... Now, actually, I'm just going over some of the other slides that I made. So, maybe we can... Maybe that one can serve as a recap. Mm. Yeah, let's see. So, actually, yeah. Mm. So, uh, I hope you're listening carefully to what I'm saying and not focusing much on the slide that is being shown. So, just, just pay attention to what I'm saying. The other part, so... The only reason, the single reason, not the single most important reason, but the single reason, literally the only reason. I cannot emphasize this enough. And there's a point I'm trying to make. So please listen carefully. Literally the only reason the Pandavas won the war was because of Sri Krishna's presence. Absolutely nothing else. If you see every time little, little issues arised, arose, and Sri Krishna came to the help of the Pandavas. He was the one who came up with the plan of how to kill Bhishma with Shikhandi and that whole plan. He was the one who came up with the plan how to kill Dronacharya with that Ashwatthama elephant versus his son having, you know, all that. Karna. Now, all these, uh, again, I'm kind of going off script a little. This is another big thing in people's mind. Oh, Krishna did all these immoral things. If you read the Mahabharat, you will find 100% morality in all of these actions, which we can talk about if you have questions. I don't want to spend a lot of time anticipating your questions and answering them as part of the main class. So the point is, absolute the or the only reason for the victory of the Pandavas is Shri Krishna. And one Shri Krishna was heavy on all these other super generals on the other side. Okay? Now, Duryodhan did not realize that. Arjuna clearly realized that. He knew. He's a devotee, like Shrikar just asked. So there was no doubt in his mind. And you remember that whole incident when both Duryodhan and, Shri, and, and Arjun go to Shri Krishna to ask for, you know, which side you're on. And Krishna divides himself up. Says, I am on one side and I won't even fight. And my whole army and everything, all my resources are on the other side. Very happily, Duryodhan picks all the resources and Arjun picks Shri Krishna. And both got what they wanted. They were both happy. There was never a conflict that, oh, I want, they wanted the same thing. Arjun wanted Shri Krishna and Duryodhan did not want Shri Krishna. Duryodhan wanted their army and Arjun did not want the army. Both went away fully happy. Now, and right then and there, it was decided pretty much who would win the war. Because Shri Krishna is Shri Krishna, he is Bhagwan. So, the point to understand here is what I have been building it up to. Is that God may come in front of you, as one may say, in flesh and blood. He was there in front of Duryodhan. Right there. But he had no recognition that this person, Krishna, is God. He had no knowledge of that. Otherwise, he would have chosen him. Otherwise, he would have not opted to even fight the battle. He would have said, you know what? I, 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 you know, I withdraw. Give these Pandavas five villages and I will, I don't want to take Panga with Bhagwan. Who can survive fighting with God? And they knew all the Shastras. They knew what happened to Hiranyakashipu. They knew what happened to Ravan. They knew all these things. Nobody has survived 
trying to take on Lord Vishnu and Krishna is Lord Vishnu or Lord Vishnu is Krishna or whichever way. But Duryodhan had no knowledge of this, even though he was in right there. And many people, so now how does this translate to us? So by the way, this whole discussion is about how does this all translate to us? Attachments was the first thing that we talked about. And the main character who's the most attached or attachments as a thing that becomes very prominent, the person you can put behind that is Dhritarashtra, completely attached to his son. The second aspect is, is this atheist or demoniac or complete what is the root of it is agyana, ignorance that this person is God. So many people say, oh, I don't believe or in, in God. If God were to come in front of me, then I would believe. If he came and told me, how do I know that this book, Bhagavad Gita is spoken by God? If he comes in front of me and says, I spoke this book, I will live my life by the book. Many people have said that. And I say to them that Duryodhan didn't do that. Lord Krishna went to him to make peace. Said, please just give five villages. And Duryodhan said, not even a pin of land. Which means, not only which means, it is he, he just thought that Krishna is just the king of Dwarka. He had no recognition, or a very powerful king. But I have many other powerful people on my side, so that, you know, power. And no recognition of who is God. So, don't think that you are at a disadvantage if you did not see God. Even if you see God, there is no guarantee you will recognize Okay. So don't be in this trap. Oh, I didn't see God. How am I to believe? Duryodhan and many other demons saw God and they didn't believe. So that's not a valid argument that if I saw God, I would believe. God's words are available here in this book. Many, many, many saints and acharyas have in their samadhi gone and seen and confirmed that these are literally God's words. God has spoken to them and confirmed, yes, these are my words. So this text, Bhagavad Gita, is, is accurate. It's valid. It has not undergone changes over the years. We know this because our Acharyas have revalidated it, reconfirmed it by connecting with Krishna in their Samadhi. And these are the words in our hands, printed in a book or on the website or what you may have. And that's all we need to live our life. So we have the same access that Arjun had. We should not feel disadvantaged. And we it's useless or pointless to demand if God were to come in front, that's a useless or pointless argument. So Duryodhan is going around beating his own drum about his own power and completely ignoring the supreme power on the other side, which is Shri Krishna. And then we will see in the next section, 14 to 19, the importance of having Hanumanji on the flag. It is also mentioned that Hanumanji was present on the flag of the chariot of Arjuna. So all the signs of religiosity are present on the Pandava's side. Yeah. Okay. Before we get into the next section, yes, there was a question. Raman Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dandavat Pranam. Uh, I was trying to understand if 
Duryodhan or Dhritarashtra have a backstory like Hiranyakashyap or uh, Ravan, etc. Uh, do Duryodhan or Dhritarashtra have a backstory of the previous Janmas, etc.? I'm sure they do. Mahabharata is huge and I read half of it, not half, about a third of it. And then I kind of got di distracted and deviated. So, uh, yeah, I cannot recall right now. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. Yes, my wife is reminded. I have said this in previous classes. So, uh, Dhritarashtra has a backstory that he was a hunter 50 lifetimes ago, 5 0. And a very like a violent hunter. And at one point, there was a tree full of birds' nests. And he specifically lit fire to that tree to enjoy the death of all those birds and all those nests. And he was cursed that all his children would die. Not even one would survive. And um, to even uh, suffer this suffering, it was said that you have to first go through 50 lifetimes of suffering or 49 lifetimes of suffering more to even come to the stage where you can receive this punishment. So there's a punishment to be able to receive a punishment. And then in that lifetime, you will lose all your sons. And then you will attain liberation, which is what happens at the end of Dhritarashtra's life. Anyway, so that's the backstory there. But yeah, that's what I can say. Thank you. Aditi. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Uh, I had a question. You were mentioning how Duryodhan couldn't acknowledge that Krishna was the Supreme Personality of Godhead, even though he was in front of him. So my question, so I, I'm assuming that at that point in time, in that yuga, obviously they went to school and they were taught the Shastras. Um, in the Shastras, was it not ever explicitly mentioned that Krishna was the supreme personality of God? Like, for, was it not taught to them from mm -hmm. the beginning? And so, um, the name of Krishna, yes, is present in the Shastra, not just in the Mahabharata or in the Srimad Bhagavatam, but in ancient, not ancient, I mean, assuming these were more like written at the time of, by, even in the Vedas, the name Krishna is mentioned. Mm-hmm which were definitely present before yeah. the events of Mahabharata occurred and so on. But the point is, there will always be doubt. There will always be, who is that Krishna? Is he the same? Now, do you have a friend called Krishna right now in 2024? No, you don't have anybody named Krishna? Krishna, Agarwal, Krishna, oh, yeah. whatever, you know, yeah. Singh, whatever, right? Krishna, Mishra, or whatever. One can say, oh, is this Krishna? No, he can't be the Krishna. He's just an ordinary person whose name happens to be Krishna. Doubts will always be there. Oh, we have all read Shastra ourselves. Have we fully surrendered to Krishna? We have not. So, I have not. So, after having, so reading Shastra, and having Shastra Shraddha, very different things. Yeah. So there can be Shastra present, one can read it, one can understand it, but whether one internalizes it and has faith in it, Shraddha, and is willing to act upon the conclusions or act by the conclusions is not a guarantee. Okay. Okay. Thank you. In the Mahabharat, um, let alone the Shastras, Bhishma and Vidur were fully aware of who is Krishna, of his position. And they themselves advised Dhritarashtra. 
but he also did not listen. Yeah. After Bhishma died, or not died, he died like later, he had this boon of Ichhamrityu or, you know. But anyway, when he was like disabled and uh, Drona had took up the army and this news reached Dhritarashtra, that was the first biggest shock in the Mahabharat war to Dhritarashtra. Like, wait a minute, what? Bhishma fell? And it is written in the Mahabharata. I have gone through that section. And that night, Dhritarashtra acknowledges Krishna as Bhagavan and says, it is all a, you know, act of my own stupidity and I have got into this and all. By all that, that whole sort of mood is there. It seems as if Dhritarashtra will walk up now and stop the war. Next morning, it's all gone. So that is what happens to us also when we hear a powerful lecture by Srila Prabhupada or some very pure devotee. We feel very inspired. Half an hour later, once we walk out of the room and life takes over, we are back to normal. And that is why constant association is so important. So the process is gradual. It's not overnight. With some very, very pure devotees, it can be overnight. Like for Mirgari Hunter, Narad Muni touched him or spoke one word to him. Same thing in case of Valmiki Rishi. He was a hunter. Narad Muni, you know, was such a, he, he's the purest of pure devotees. So yes, transformation can happen in a matter of seconds or minutes, but not for everyone. So yes, doubts. We will talk about the topic of doubts in chapter 7. How debilitating they are. Thank you. Okay. So let's continue forward. So uh, now the third topic, Arjun requests Lord Krishna to draw the chariot in the middle of the armies and he begins to shiver on seeing the who's on the other side. Now I want to similarly point out, you must understand who is Arjun. He is not this some, you know, just a strong warrior. He is Arjun. He is somebody who is supremely powerful. In war or battle, he is not as accomplished as Bhishma, but he is still a very, very, very powerful warrior. And when I say powerful, it's not just muscle strength, the kind of weapons that he obtained in the last 13, in the 13 years of the, of the uh, exile or the 12 years when he minus the one incognito or Agyatvas, the Pashupatastra of Lord Shiva, how he was able to fight Lord Shiva. I mean, unimaginable. He did not sleep for 12 years. The kind of tapasya, austerities, penance he did to accumulate all the weapons, all these things. And he knew a war is coming. He absolutely knew that, which is why he was accumulating all these weapons. So he is not an ordinary person. But when faced in the moment of truth, when you finally have to actually, you can do all kind of preparation. It's very different from the real situation. Now, as students, many of you will know, you know, sample tests or previous year's question papers, you can solve it all perfectly. But when you actually go into your own day of exam and you get your fresh question paper, it's a whole different thing. You can solve previous year's question papers. Oh, I was getting 100% in all the previous year's tests. This year's test, I got only 50%. It's a whole different situation. Even Arjun faced that. And we will talk about that in just a second. 
and finally there's this big section about his doubts his lamentations and you know all these things uh, come up in the mind of arjun so let's move forward on the slides now so now chapter 1 uh so by the way i am taking questions as we go so i'm not going to reserve a whole lot of time at the end for q and a so if you have questions raise your hands and we will try to deal with them periodically all right and we'll try to end in 2 hours which out of which you know 1 hour and 10 minutes are already gone so many people including myself used to think oh chapter 1 is kind of not very useful or let's just go through it fast. It is just a bunch of names, a lot of names, a lot of just this conch or that conch and this and that and a whole bunch of things. Okay, Arjun is getting cold feet. He's giving all sorts of reasons. He's just throwing tantrums like, you know, you try to tell a child to eat and he will say, oh, I'm having stomach ache. Oh, you know, this or that or too hot or too spicy. All, you know, useless reasons. And finally, the mother has to just force the child to eat. So basically, it's like almost like a tantrum, one may think, that one is throwing. That is not the case. Or people think, let's just get through chapter one quickly. And the real stuff comes in chapter two. The soul and all that stuff. But what is the significance of chapter one? Chapter one is very, very, very significant. Chapter one... So now all of you that have been through school, which I am assuming is 100% of the population here, will agree that in any exam, they say understanding the question is half the solution, isn't it? You have to really understand what is being asked and especially in a more complicated subject. And if you understand the question, that's half the problem solved. It's a general saying, and I fully agree with it. If you fully understand what is the problem statement, and even in workplace, I work at Intel as an engineer, if you know what problem you are trying to solve, you can come up with an effective solution. You can make the right trade-offs. Like they say in engineering, oh, I need to know the usage model. Without knowing the usage model, it's very hard to define a solution. What trade-offs to make? What are we really trying to accomplish? Otherwise, you can come up with a solution which is a jigsaw or a, you know, a, a patchwork of, of a bunch of cool ideas. But it is nobody knows what problem you are trying to solve. Chapter 1 is trying to present the problem statement to which chapters 2 to 18 are the solution. So Bhagavad Gita is a solution from chapter 2 to chapter 18. The problem is given in chapter 1. I would say understanding chapter 1 is as important as chapters 2 to 18 combined. That's the importance of chapter 1. And the important part of chapter 1 is to see yourself in it. Then Bhagavad Gita will be applicable to you in your life. Now many people are doing Bhakti Shastri, but I hope they are doing it with the motivation of applying the Bhagavad Gita, not for a degree certificate, without the practical application part. That would be lame if one does it for that reason. So I'm assuming 100% of the population, the certificate is a byproduct. 100% of the population is interested in applying the Bhagavad Gita in your life. Now you are not Arjun. You are not fighting World War Three or World War Zero. That was the first World War before World War One. whatever. You are not in that situation. But we are in our little, little small wars. We have our own small attachments. Just like Dhritarashtra, Duryodhan, Arjun, and so on. So if you identify the problem in your life that you are trying to solve, then the entire Bhagavad Gita, you can apply it as a solution to your specific problem. 
and it will be very useful. Otherwise, you will become an expert on Bhagavad Gita. You may be able to recite verses. You may be able to do so many things. But you won't be able to put it all together and see how it applies in my life. You may be able to, you know, see or tell, I ask you a question, tell different, 20 different characteristics of the soul. You will be able to tell it, fat, 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 soul is not, cannot be dried, it cannot be cut, it cannot be killed, it can, you know, all these things you can tell. How does it really apply to you? So that is chapter one. That is the significance of chapter one to identify the problem. And that is why I said in the last class, those who have some kind of suffering in their life and have come to this class or are reading Bhagavad Gita inside or outside the class, wherever, for the purpose of understanding why this is, I remember I asked this question, why me? Those who have such a burning question, they will understand Bhagavad Gita. And Arjun was in that situation. So let us, with that, that is the significance of chapter one. So it is a nice opportunity for all of the participants of Bhagavad Gita, including myself, to contemplate what is it that I am trying to accomplish through the Bhagavad Gita? What problem in my life am I trying to solve? That's a very good approach to understanding Bhagavad Gita. Then it will become like a on-the-job training. You have a problem to solve and you are using Bhagavad Gita to apply it in your life. So, we'll go through some of these as we go through the material. Uh, the one thing I would like to talk, again, you know, so now uh, we, are, we are getting into the part where Arjuna is getting cold feet. He does not want to fight. People would say, yeah, it's a good thing to avoid war. Why fight? Why kill anyone? But there is this whole aspect of justice or dharma. And if we, you know, and in, in justice, you have to sometimes kill people. So many ghastly crimes occur. And if you don't award the right punishment, then that's not justice. It's not some kind of revenge or some kind of sadistic pleasure that the victim or the victim's family gets. But that's how the, the material world would work. So that others are given a reminder that there is something called justice, there is something called consequence. And that whole thing is the aspect of justice or dharma. And as kshatriyas, among the four varnas, brahmana, kshatriya, vaishya and shudra, it's the job of the kshatriyas to uphold the dharma or justice. And therefore, Arjun has to, you know, his, his, even Yudhishthir agrees that yes, let's fight if, if, you know, this is a matter of justice. Okay. So that is one aspect that one must understand that why one should fight in this case. Now comes these two points. On both sides, why the whole Mahabharat occurred, war occurred because of attachments. So this is the central point. Now, we are, none of you are here are, as I assume, high court justices who have to deliver justice. You're not even probably police officers who get to, you know, do some little small justice on the, on the sidewalks or the street. Not everything goes to the courts. Sometimes police officers settle it at their level. But attachments applies to everyone universally. And the suffering for us comes from our attachments. The attachments can be very succinctly summarized in these two words, maam, aham. Mine, me and mine. Aham is me and maam is mine. Me and mine. It's 
all about that. That is the root, me and mine. And at many times, we prioritize me and mine over what is right. Just simple things like, you know, getting ahead in your, in a company, you know, you know that, you know, maybe, you know, somebody asks you for feedback on something and you don't, uh, you know, you, you think that, oh, if I give good feedback to that person, then his project will be successful compared to mine. So even though I really feel that the other project is very nicely done, I will not give good feedback or whatever may be the case. So many situations of me and mine. Or, yeah, just, I, I mean, um, innumerable such situations we are faced with. So that leads to all kinds of problems. We do not have our priorities set straight. And when we are asked to make choices, we get conflicted. We know what is right. And that is where the conflict is versus our attachments. If we do what is right, if we completely put our attachments on the shelf, on the side, I cannot think of any situation in my life where I don't have clarity on what that, what's the right thing, what's what to do. There's never two right things to do. There's always one right thing and most people are clear about what is the right thing to do. There's not much um, dispute about it. The only thing that comes in dispute with what is right is what are my attachments. That's the only thing that conflicts. If you remove attachments, it's very clear on what the path that one should take. If you have counter examples, I would love to hear between two right things where your attachments are completely not playing a role. It's never the case. So we will see in, and of course, Dhritarashtra and Duryodhan have very strong attachments, but and, and what Yudhishthir and Arjun are trying to do is to deliver justice. That's all that they are trying to do or seek justice. And sometimes justice has to be through war. But now we will see Arjun's attachments. So there are two types of attachments. When we say attachments, now this is another very important point in the Bhagavad Gita. Please pay attention. Attachments, typically we think about negative. Like I just gave the example, my project versus his project, whatever. My child versus his child and so on. But in Arjun's case, it is attachment to good things versus what is right. That is why the first bullet is justice or dharma. Arjun is attached to good things. Let me forgive the bad guy. I agree he is the bad guy. As per principles of dharma, he is supposed to be punished. But let me forgive him because I am such a kind person fellow. I want the world to remember how kind I am, how compassionate I am, how forgiving I am. That's an attachment. It's not like I want, Arjun wants his biography to be written and to, you know, for him to be hailed. But sometimes it's just in your own eyes. I just want to be the kindest person. Whether anybody knows or not, doesn't matter. I just, that's also an attachment. You know, it's an attachment to a good thing, but still it is attachment. Over doing the right thing, which is to deliver justice. Now, delivering justice also, keep in mind, is not just to set an example for others. One can also think, oh, I will kill this person, give this person capital punishment as a judge so that others will not do. That's one reason to set an example that there is consequence, right? Of giving punishment to the culprit. The other point, very important, and this probably is not captured in any constitution of the country, 
But the other point is that you are making that person pay by his own suffering and alleviate his karma. You are helping the person to not carry forward the karma into the next life. Because if he doesn't get punished in this life, and every life it says, the Dharma Shastras say, karma doubles, like compound interest. So better to suffer sooner, pay less interest, right? On your credit card, the sooner you pay, the lower interest you pay. The more you wait, the higher you have to pay, the more you have to pay. It's the same thing with karma. So the justice system is helping the person by forcing him to pay sooner. So it's beneficial for the culprit. And of course, the justice has to be truly justice. You cannot have mistakes in justice. That's a given. Innocent people shouldn't be punished and criminals should not be let go. So there are limitations of present justice system. Leaving that aside, assuming the justice system is perfect, it works both for the benefit of the criminal as well as to set an example for others. There are two benefits. So we were talking about attachments and good kind of attachments. So we will see what are Arjuna's attachments. And this leads to the next point as to the qualities to understand Bhagavad Gita. These are the qualities, these good qualities, even though Arjun is little confused between his goodness versus being a dharmic person. As a kshatriya, it's his duty to uphold dharma. So he was confused about the two. He was trying to be a brahmana. For a brahmana, he can, he's allowed to forgive his aggressor, not a kshatriya. And we are talking about Brahman and Kshatriya as a nature, not by birth. It's not versus you are a Singh versus a Sharma. It's not your last name. So, uh, by quality. So, the quality is to understand uh, these, these goodness qualities that are there in Arjuna make him a good candidate to understand Bhagavad Gita. So if you must develop these qualities, the more you have these qualities, the better you will understand Bhagavad Gita. This is the third, this other point. Material preparation is good, but not good enough. It's a very important point. Even to solve material problems, this war with the Kauravas is a material thing. It's not spiritual. Isn't it? It's happening on the planet earth and you know with arrows and whatever bombs and nuclear missiles whatever you know brahmastra is nothing but a nuclear missile of 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 you know that time so it's a material thing but and arjun was best prepared best prepared for the war but in that moment he was getting cold feet he was feeling like chickening out so all his preparation, which was all at a material level. Now, he, there was spiritual preparation as well, but material preparation was completely solid. And the point being made here is that unless there is strong spiritual foundation in the best of people, when the situation, the most trying circumstances occur, all material preparation fails. But even a little amount of spiritual preparation goes a really, really, really long way. There is this beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita 2.40 which says exactly the same thing. Neha bhikrama nasho asti pratyavayo na vidyate svalpam apya asya dharmasya trayate mahato bhayat. A small amount of advancement on the path of spiritual, on the spiritual path can save you trayate mahato bhayat from the greatest kind of fear, greatest problems. So that is another point that spiritual solutions are way more powerful 
and potent than the best material solutions. And the last point is another six. These are the some of the things to be taken away from chapter one. And the last point was only if God were to come before me. We discussed that already. That, you know, that's not a very sound argument. One can still make it. But uh, in case of Dhritarashtra, Duryodhan, it didn't work. They couldn't see, even if, even though they were told. So, with that, the next discussion is on attachments, which is a central point of chapter one. We will, we have already discussed it. Now we will go quickly through some of the points. But before that, I see some questions. So, Arnab. Uh, Hare Krishna. Prabhu, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my question is that uh, things that happen with us in our lifetime, current lifetime, whether it is good or bad, is that a result of a justice being served to us or injustice happening to us? Is there a way to find that out? Yes. So, very good question. And let me rephrase that question in a certain way. But, okay, the short answer is no, it is not possible much to find out. With some very superior guidance, it may be possible to find out. But it is more important to take care of our actions or our response to the situation rather than worrying about the cause of the situation. A good sadhak, we are all trying to be a sadhak or another way English word could be a seeker, a spiritual seeker not to worry about the cause of the current situation, but our response to the current situation. That is what Bhagavad Gita will teach us. In verse number chapter 4, and now you, can, you should have your book in front of you. You can flip through, like I am flipping through, right in front, chapter 4, verse number 17. Says, Karmano hi api bodhavyam, bodhavyam cha vikarmanaha, akarmanas cha bodhavyam, gahana karmano gatihi. So, first three terms are being described karma, vikarma, and akarma. I'm going to skip that. The last line it says, gahana karmano gatihi. There are various types of karma called karma or sukarma, that is what is called vikarma and akarma. Forget all that terminology. Ultimately, Lord Krishna is saying, Gahana Karmano Gatihi, this logic, this, this law of karma is very, very, very complex. Even the United States law is so complex. You do not have a lawyer in United States, all of the law. You have a criminal lawyer, a civil lawyer, a immigration lawyer, what else? Corporate law. Uh, this law, you know, Krishna Murari Prabhu can tell us uh, so many other, he's a lawyer. So no one person can fit it in his all in his head. And this is for one lifetime only. All the law of today's countries are for this lifetime. Krishna's law spans across lifetimes. It's just extremely complex, extremely complex. That is the meaning of Gahana Karmano Gatihi. Now, to your other part, justice or injustice, that's a very good thing. And whatever, let's say some bad thing or good thing, both are happening to us, they could happen out of two causes. One is a result of our past karma. And the second is if some new karma, let's say you're being hurt by someone, somebody is coming and hurting you. Let's just take that example. It could be because you hurt him in the past and therefore the, you know, the system of karma is creating a situation for him to hurt you back. So that is, in your words, justice being served to you. Now he can choose to show compassion and, and not do that. That's his choice. That's the free will that he has. But still the situation has been arranged so that he will be able to hurt you. Or it's just his samskara. He is choosing to create fresh karma by hurting you and starting a cycle. 
then sometime later in this life or future life, you will get a chance to get your revenge. And the karma cycle, new karmas, all the time they begin. New karmas begin because people have free will and they can choose to inflict sinful activity on others. And then the cycle, new cycles begin and sometimes you are part of a previously running cycle. It's very complex, not possible to know. I hope that answers your question. Vikas Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji. Uh, uh, I assume you can hear me okay. Yes. Um, so on the previous uh, slide, you had shown there was a bullet that said qualities to be able to understand the Bhagavad Gita. Yes. Um, um, I understood the words that you mentioned in the context of um, Arjun and uh, being a Kshatriya, but I failed to connect what are the qualities to understand the Bhagavad Gita so I can determine what all do I need to have in me so that I bring myself to a place that I can understand the Bhagavad Gita as much as possible. Thank you. Very nice. And we are that's exactly the topic of the next few minutes. So I hope that your question will be answered very soon right now in the next few after, after the round of Q&A is over. Thank you. Shrikar. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hare Krishna. Okay. Hare Krishna. Um, so I have two questions. Um, one question is a follow-up to the previous question I asked. Um, you're talking about in this slide how Arjuna had like a lot of attachment towards his relatives. Um, but uh, this attachment is primarily to desire. And Drona, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you say that again? Sorry, quick. primarily to not that much for Duryodhan, for example, even though, yes, he was very kind and okay, but his oh, true attachment and love for, for Bhishma and Drona. But go ahead, okay. Um but this attachment is material attachment. Right? Yes. And <clears throat> you also mentioned that uh, the Pandavas are Raghunuga Bhaktas who are Nitya Siddhas. So they came directly from the spiritual world to assist with uh, Krishna's pastime. Now, I know that my answer to the answer to my question can be attributed to Leela or just saying that they were there as part, uh, as part like in part to assist with Krishna's pastime. But I mean, even in Bhakti Samta Sindhu, like Anyabhulash Tatsunyam, Sunyam, like we know that the like the definition of the highest form of bhakti is without any tinge of material desire or any desire other than Krishna. They are desire. not acting as they, their role is right now to be a kshatriya. And I, I can see kind of where you're going. So let me sorry to interrupt, but uh, they are Again, like you said, this is something that is orchestrated by Lord Krishna so that the whole uh, Bhagavad Gita can be delivered and the um, devote, devotional quality can be completely clarified into Arjuna or in Arjuna as to why he is fighting the war. By the end of the Bhagavad Gita, you will see that Arjuna no longer fights the war for the sake of being of delivering justice. He fights the war as an act of bhakti. And that is a clear shift that will happen from the beginning of Bhagavad Gita to the end of Bhagavad Gita. So that is precisely the point of the Bhagavad Gita is to do everything for the pleasure of Krishna, even if that activity means fighting a war. So by this process, did Arjuna become a better devotee after Krishna recited the Bhagavad Gita to him? Yes. Yes. Okay. But what he was already a devotee before. Yeah, but so he's a devotee. He was... It's not like he was a lesser devotee 99% and now after hearing Bhagavad Gita, he became 100%. But okay. Srila Prabhupada says in the 
comment in the purport to in the one of the verses, initial verses of the fourth chapter, where that he already knows all these things, but it is for our understanding that this whole thing is um, orchestrated. Okay. Okay. Okay, Babu. Um, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. My second question is, um, in Arjuna's situation, he he wanted to show compassion to Bhishma and Drona, as you said. Mm -hmm. Um, but in in Arjuna's case, it was very clear that this was like not desiring not to fight was is is a bad uh is a bad decision because to to like to fulfill Krishna's desire, he, he Arjuna needed to fight. But in a lot of our situations, practically in life, there's a lot of situations where we have to decide between showing compassion and maybe not showing compassion. So I feel like to determine what our dharma is, specifically in these like more practical, lesser scale scenarios, is much more it's a much more difficult decision to make. So can you touch upon maybe how Out to... a specific situation it's very hard to comment. And in general, I would say show compassion. So in the Bhagavad Gita, there are qualities now. Specifically for the case of Arjuna, Krishna is saying go fight. But there are general qualities of devotees given. A very good set of those is given in chapter 13, verse numbers 8 to 12. And chapter 14, uh, verse numbers um, um, 1 to 3. And okay. there, the 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 qualities such as karuna means compassion, kshama means forgiveness, uh, ahimsa means non-violence are all repeated over and over and over again. So the general principle is to show compassion, love and friendliness to all living entities and to forgive and to tolerate. So that is the general instruction. Uh, it it is very 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 uncommon that you would as a as a pure devotee have to uh, not show compassion on another living entity. Very uncommon. So when you said it is hard to decide between to show compassion or not, mm, you're probably. Like, I was thinking uh, in the sense of like. Maybe showing anger towards Vaishnava Parad or something, I, I, you know. There, like, there are those like those those corner cases, and in many times it is not our place to show anger on Vaishnava Parad. The there the best solution is to leave the situation, step out and and just just disappear, instead right. of trying to be the judge and the and the you know the 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 guru of anyone. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Thank you so Raman much. Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh, actually, I was uh, looking at the second point, the root cause of all suffering is maam or aham. So I was trying to apply it. Uh, I mean, it, if it is applicable for all, was it also applicable for Bhishma Pitama? Because... Um, at the end, he he got the, uh, you know, when he was about to leave his body, Bhagwan Krishna appeared. I mean, he was with him, uh, right next to him. So can we say that if we have to attain that spiritual bliss, we have to suffer in the material world? Is it fair to say that? I was with you till some time. Now, you, is your question that to, to attain spiritual bliss, we have to suffer in the material world? Yeah, we have to undergo suffering in the material world. Is that fair to say that? No. Why is suffering a necessity? Bhakti is the necessity to attain the spiritual bliss. But suffering is not a mandatory prerequisite for doing uttama bhakti or top class bhakti. Okay. Or I am not getting your question correctly. Basically, my question was, Prabhuji, here you have written the root cause of all suffering is maam or aham, right? Yes. So, how, okay, first thing, how is it applicable for Bhishma Pitam? Is it applicable for him? This suffering? Yes, of course. Uh, of course. Now, Bhishma Pitama, at a certain level of understanding, he is a Mahajan. So, he is really not suffering in that sense. But yes, we do see he is suffering and all. And he was more attached to his word that he had given 
again going very back in the uh, mahabharat in the very beginning he had taken a vow to protect the current uh, the, the 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 throne basically if you remember that whole uh, episode where um, his uh, father um, who was he shantanu uh, wanted to marry the satyavati the, the the daughter of the fisherman or something yeah. and uh, uh, he already had a son through ganga which was bhishma pitama and you know there was this whole thing that my children will become kings and he said okay i will you know um uh, he he told his father bhishma told his father i will i will uh, uh, i will not want the king kingdom i will rather protect whoever is the current king and then she said okay but what about your children they may want the kingdom he said okay i will never marry so i'll never even have children that's why he was known as bhishma pitama somebody who took such a strong vow anyway that's the history about bhishma pitama but one of the vows he took is to protect the current person on the throne he gave that that if your children become come and sit on the throne i it's my duty to protect them that is the attachment he had Mama. yes that was his attachment i am a man of my word okay then pran jaye par vachan na jaye yes prabhuji but he also got that ichha mrityu thing as a boon right and yes, then yes. bhagwan bhi bhagwan also was next to him so usme kaise how is it a suffering for him at the end of the day it was a spiritual at a certain he... level it is not suffering so yeah. there is a complex aspect but again yeah. it is all lord's arrangement where he uses yeah. his devotees to enact certain um orchestrate certain pastimes for our all our learning yes, yes. sukirtan prabhu hari shri prabhu ji uh, so when krishna recited the bhagavad gita to arjuna after that happened did arjuna still have any sense of material attachment or was that eradicated after hearing the bhagavad gita all sense of material attachment was eradicated okay i'll try the second and question one, one can ask how can he have the material attachment he was already a pure devotee and again this is all like going in circles but lord krishna temporarily put him into illusion so that the bhagavad gita could be narrated so my second question was um when the pandavas and dropati when they uh left the material world to go to the upper planetary system they they went to kailash mountain but when they were walking up each of the i'm not sure this is correct but i heard this somewhere each of the pandus they they fell down besides you this year they fell down to the hellish planets because um some reason i'm not sure about my question was why did these why did the pandus beside you this year and dropati fell for down? one day one day only and each one's reason is given uh, okay i don't remember all the reasons but again it is there to show that yes even one has to be very careful you cannot declare yourself i am a pure devotee 100% one has to be still very careful so uh draupadi for example uh, even though she had five husbands and again that's a whole different thing i don't want to get into that five husbands and this and that and there's a whole chapter in bhagwa in mahabharat about this whole discussion okay so it's not something lightly that i am taking it's a very deep topic anyway she was expected to treat all of them equally she had special attachment for arjun in her heart that was her mistake for bhima it was he would eat too much and he always like took the share of others or his mother had to cook like if she cooked 100% 50% was for bhima the remaining 50% was divided among the everybody else that was his proportion of eating and similarly like you know the others uh, arjuna i think he was too proud. too proud of his archery skills uh, and his beauty bodily beauty or i think that was nakul and sahadev which, which were proud about their bodily beauty anyway they had all these small small uh, things that caused them to yeah anyway so coming back was does that answer your question oh uh, yes sorry i just had another question so you said you stated these small reasons why each uh, person descended down to these 
hellish planets, but aren't these for Arjuna? You said after Krishna recited the Bhagavad Gita, his material attachments were eradicated. But isn't isn't the fact that you're attached to your archery skills a material attachment? Before the Bhagavad Gita, so he had accumulated that before. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, now again, one can always ask the question by taking the name of Krishna once all the karma is eradicated, so why did he still have to suffer and so on. Again, we are going into Bhakti Rasamrit Sindhu discussion. So let's let's try to keep it focused on today's topic. Okay, okay. let's continue forward. So we discussed this. Okay, Arjuna's attachments. So again, uh, there are four key attachments that Arjun displayed. And let's let's go through this in separate slides. So attachment to Swajanas or King Spit. So here is the verse. I have picked one sample verse, four verses that indicate each of the attachments. So Nacha Shreyo Anupashyami Hatva Swajanam Ahave. So Hatva Swajanam I do not see how any Shreya, anything good can come out of Hatva Swajanam, out of killing Swajanam. So he is attached to his Swajanas. That's his attachment. Bigger or whatever. Again, there's no like this one percentage. But he's he's thinking about it. It's not just about delivering justice. So that is one attachment to my Swajana, my kingsman. Then another one is attachment to punya or attachment to not being a sinful person. Now, when a judge gives capital punishment, he doesn't think that I am committing sin. He's been given the position of a judge to decide a case and award the to somebody he awards capital punishment and to somebody he awards uh, a million dollar, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, what do you call payment or uh, reward? Uh, so, so the judge has to be fair, and that is the duty of a kshatriya. But he's judge doesn't think if I award capital punishment, I will get sin. Arjun is getting confused about it, and that's why he says, Papa meva ashraye asman hatva etan. So, you know, if we if we kill these people, I will get Papam Eva Ashrayet Asman. That I will I will have to incur or I'll have to take shelter of Papa. So I will basically get Papa. And I don't want Papa. I want Punya only. And as we will see further in Bhagavad Gita, both Papa and Punya are binding. One has to get relieved from all karmic reaction. Now, karma doesn't... Typically, we think karma means bad karma. Karma is bad karma and as well as it is good karma. So, one has to be relieved from both. That is spirituality. Not increase punya karma. If you increase punya karma, we'll go through this in Bhagavad Gita. We cannot cover all Bhagavad Gita today. The third one is his attachment to preserving Kula Dharma. Kula Kshaye Pranashyanti, Kula Dharma Sanatana. So Kula Kshaye Pranashyanti, this whole system of Kula Pranashyanti will get destroyed. This whole system of eternal system Sanatana of Kula Dharma will get destroyed. The Kulas will get destroyed. Kulakshaye, with the destruction of the dynasty, the eternal family tradition will be destroyed because it's world war. And typically the men fight in the war. The women are staying back home. If all the men are dead, you know, it will be a huge disruption in the society. So he's saying, I don't want to be responsible for pressing the button on the world war, on the nuclear button. I'd rather, you know, just, you know, take a back seat and, uh, you know, let the world work. And even if I win, 
it will be enjoyment. I'll have to enjoy the kingdom. It will be such a sour or bitter enjoyment that too on the blood of my kinsmen. Yad Raj Sukha Lobhena Raj Sukha Lobha I don't want people to think about me as somebody who got this Sukha. People to think, oh, just because of Sukha, happiness, enjoyment, he pressed the nuclear button. I want people to think I'm such a, you know, austere guy, such a simple guy. I don't want Arjuna to be known as somebody who, for his enjoyment, created so much bloodshed. So it's about his reputation. That for some sense gratification or enjoying the kingdom, I killed so many or caused the death of so many people out of greed to enjoy. So I don't want to be known as somebody. So it's that attachment of reputation or the legacy that you leave. That is the attachment that is being shown here. So now I was hoping to spend more time on this, but we are running out of time. So I'll still cover it uh, and we'll, we'll resume next time. You have to see what are your attachments. That is the problem statement for you. Remember Bhagavad Gita chapter 1 is defining the problem. So please see and all of us have problems. We sometimes suppress them. We forget them. We think, oh, it's all okay. But, and I'm not trying to say, you know, you invent or you create problems in your life. But, and you may be very lucky that you don't have problems. That's fine. But those who are really suffering right now are just better candidates. There is no two ways to say it. They are better candidates to understand Bhagavad Gita. So somehow or the other, all the others who are having a very peaceful life, you have to pray that you understand Bhagavad Gita with equal vigor or equal level as the others. So in some sense, I'm saying those who are suffering are lucky. Of not a good thing to say. But still, that's the... So you have to see where you are suffering and suffering is all because of our attachments. Now, what are our attachments? Now, sometimes the attachments are there, the suffering comes later. Like a very straightforward classical example is attachment to smoking. You may be smoking today, the consequences will come in 20 years when one gets lung disease or heart disease or whatever. So the consequences may not come today. The suffering may not come today. But attachments are there today. So maybe you can start looking at those who are... Everybody has attachments. If you didn't have attachments, you're already a you know very advanced person. You're not, you would not be attending this class. So we all have attachments. If you cannot think of suffering today... Think about the sufferings it will bring in the future. And we are talking about the bad kind of attachment, not the good kind of attachment that Arjun had. Please, people shouldn't ask a question, oh, how will suffering come if I am being kind, compassionate and forgiving? No, it will not bring suffering. It will just make you bound to future lives. We'll talk about that later in Bhagavad Gita. But we, most people have attachments that are of sinful nature. Not like Arjuna, who had good attachments. So I'm talking about the sinful kind of attachments which will bring suffering. So what are those attachments? Not the small petty ones like, you know, oh, I like to eat gulab jamun or samosa. That's my attachment. Those are attachments, but then you're, you know, and nobody's going to ask you to raise your hand and say, you have to think about it yourself. The really big ones that bring suffering. So, so many, you know. Attachment to property and money is a big, big attachment. And because, and it's not wrong to be attached to, one can say, okay, you know, I ha did hard work and I earned money. It is that greed for money that causes one to do sinful activities. Simple thing, tax fraud. And people justify it. Oh, the government is overtaxing. 
fine government may be over taxing government may be corrupt government may be using your tax money for causes that you don't believe in but that's no reason to commit tax fraud you know that you can give any amount of justification you want tax fraud is tax fraud position identity we will talk about this now it's not just about position like we say in india you know kursi se chipke hue hain or you know kissa kursi ka it's not that position it's about small small positions that one may have in one's life that i am some father may think i raised my child so nicely why did my child do this to me i was a good father so that's an attachment to your position or your identity maybe you know you were not a good son in the past life to your father or in this life or whatever you may be a very good father to your present son who knows power followers so much about followers number of likes friends causes for depression depression is another suffering association with opposite gender a big big cause for suffering recognition acknowledgement so many so so one should try to see what are ones attachments which will lead to present or future suffering and then apply the bhagavad gita with that problem statement in mind and then it will be very useful so the questions that come into one's mind are like this which we discussed a little bit last time why am i suffering the focus is on the i why am i suffering why is this happening to me why me why these impossible choices that's the classical arjun question impossible choice why why do i have this conflict of upholding dharma versus then i have to fight you know bhishma and drona if it was just duryodhan it would have been fine but this biggest thing was this bhishma and drona and looking for answers and finding none that is where bhagavad gita will provide answers many of these things can be answered by material means bhagavad gita comes in when material things fail for most people because the amount of faith or shraddha that one has on material solutions is way more than on bhagavad gita but when one realizes everything failed finally bhagavad gita comes to the rescue so again it is in those situations so lucky are those who are in that situation that is why mother kunti prays in the way that you know may i always have such situations so that i can turn to krishna because in other situations it's so hard to turn to krishna we look for material solutions and guess what those material solutions work in many cases so there is no need for bhagavad gita okay so now coming to the question of the qualities of arjuna so so many qualities arjuna displayed and these are the qualities which lord krishna will say in the 16th chapter so sorry i mentioned 14th chapter earlier verses 1 to 3 were good qualities i mentioned it's actually 16th chapter my mistake 1 to chapter verse numbers 1 2 and 3 and there he will say arjuna you have all these good qualities so don't worry a sample of these qualities is seen in these verses his soft heartedness his detachment he says i don't want to kill these people even for the three worlds even for the opulence and all the pleasures of the three worlds i reject that 
I would rather not kill these people who are my cousins, relatives, my grandfather Bhishma, my teacher Drona. Forgiveness, even for the most, he knew what, what Duryodhan did. Not once, not twice, so many times. Yet he is willing to forgive them. Taking the high ground says, even if they have done bad things, doesn't mean we need to do the same bad things or like resort to killing. Taking the high ground, the moral high ground. And again, conscious of family obligations, similar thing like we discussed, the Kula Dharma. And tolerance, ready to be killed unarmed without retaliating. Like, you know, the famous scene that comes to my mind is Mahatma Gandhi, you know, where, you know, those Britishers are beating up the people and Mahatma Gandhi's followers are going and, you know, just getting beaten up. Like, you know, full non-violence, ahimsa, like, we'll see how, how, when their hands, when will their hands begin to hurt by beating us? We will keep tolerating till their hands beat us. That is Mahatma Gandhi's statement. So these are the qualities of understanding, some of the qualities of understanding Bhagavad Gita. Nicely. Nicely. Then everything will go in. Like the aperture of the camera is wide open. All the photons go in. You get a nice picture. If the aperture of the camera is tiny, some will go in a little bit, but not as much. So being the good qualities are like opening our ourselves widely to the message of Bhagavad Gita flowing within us. So I hope Vikas Prabhu that answers your question in part. And uh, yeah. So to understand Bhagavad Gita nicely. Otherwise, what happens is there are just too many doubts. What about this? What about that? What about, what about, what about, what about? It's all about what about. But he did this to me. How can I forget? Oh, you have no idea. You have not suffered. See, look how much I have suffered. If you suffered so much, you would not be saying, asking me to follow Bhagavad Gita. You would ask revenge. Maybe that's true for me. Yes, I have not suffered as much as Yudhishthir and Arjun suffered. My wife was not, you know, snatched away and disrobed or attempted to be raped in front of a whole public. I didn't suffer that unimaginable suffering. But we learned from Bhagavad Gita that Pandavas suffered. So yes, it may be true that I cannot, I may, I'm a human being, but it, I'm teaching Bhagavad Gita. It doesn't make me like a Goswami or something or something, but we can still spread the message of Bhagavad Gita, acknowledging that we are, I am also learning along with all of you. But the more we try to develop these saintly qualities, the more we will absorb the Bhagavad Gita because these fundamental doubts will not come in our mind or this argumentative mentality or this is too much clutter in our minds. And for such people, they need more time. Stay attached. Stay attached means not attached to attachments. Stay connected to Bhagavad Gita. Gradually, it will sink in. Gradually, Krishna will cleanse our heart the, as we stay connected to him. So I will end today's class with this quote from a movie. Anybody can guess what the movie is? Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. Very nice quote. Train yourself. So it's a matter of training. It doesn't training in any field does not happen overnight. The word train itself includes a gradual progression, not overnight. Okay? But it implies consistency. It implies seriousness and sincerity. 
So consistently stay at it and practice to let go. And I have tried it on myself, I tell you. And I have seen the results in my life. This process of training to let go of our attachments. It works. 100% it works. You have to train yourself. Start with the small attachments and build up to the bigger attachments. The biggest attachments for me are not yet gone, but I can see that the process works. Okay? And here is the full quote by Yoda. And a large part of this Yoda character is inspired from, you know, the Vedic texts. So that's what he says. Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. Everything you fear to lose are our attachments. Those are the things we fear to lose. They are called another name for attachment is things that we fear to lose. Train yourself to let go. And then he says how our attachments lead to suffering. Very nicely. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. Very um, insightful. So we will end it here. And next time we will start with chapter 2. Any last minute questions, comments? Okay. Yes, uh, Ramya Ataji, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, Prabhuji, I had one question about the master slides that you called out. About? First, we talk about uh, the qualities that we need and about attachments and detachments. So, uh, and in that, there was a point about like being a good father, being a good mother. And that's form of attachment. Um, and then the following slide, we talk about Arjuna's quality, where we say that conscious of family duties is in being like a good mother, a good father, a part of your conscious duties towards your family. Oh, yes, yes, it is. But being attached to the identity that we will cover this in the next class, being attached to the identity that I'm a good mother. Be a good mother, but don't claim yourself to be a good mother. Don't go beating around the drum that I am a good mother, even in your own mind. It's not like good mothers don't go around telling, see how good I am. But in their own um, view, they are a good mother. Out of anger, I'll give you a small example. Out of anger, maybe the child says to you, let's say the milk you boy gave to the child was too hot one day. Every day you are giving good milk to the child, good temperature. One day you were whatever, busy or whatever. And the child gets angry. Mama, you gave such hot milk. My tongue got burnt. You're such a bad mother. You don't even know. And if at that moment you get triggered, and you say, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, so many days, all these years, I have been such a good mother. You didn't see that. And today, one day it happened. And can't you see I'm so busy? I'm so tired. I'm da, 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 da. You don't see how good a mother I am. You rascal. You, you know, you, you're not a good son. I wish, you know, I had a better son than you. All this, you know, where is that anger coming from? And then later on, how much suffering will be there in your heart that all these harsh words you said? Very often. So being a good mother is different from developing the identity of a good mother. Think about it, okay? Let it sink in. Yeah, thank you. We are very attached to our identity. And yes, we do a lot of work to earn the identity. We do a lot of work to earn the identity, but then we really, you know, we, it's like my earning. Nobody better, you know, touch my earnings. If you touch it, I will, I will give you a piece of my mind. That is the problem. 
Thank you. I hope you understand. Yeah. Yes, Raman Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, uh, this uh, fear uh, is the root of um, root of uh, anger in the quote that you sh showed. And, uh, in that we quote, have... yes, but uh, yes. that's not the only cause for anger. Okay. Okay, no, so I was just coming to that. So so we have, uh, in, in Bhagavad Gita, we see uh, contemplation on certain things that you desire. So desire becomes the cause there. Uh, and when fear... you don't get it, fear yeah, or anger can come out of two reasons. If you desire something and you don't get it, you become angry. Okay? okay. And if you got it, but it was taken away from you, then also you get angry. And before it is taken away, you are afraid it will get taken away someday. So all the time there is anxiety and suffering. But sorry, what was your question? No, no, exactly. You answered it. Thank you. Okay. Krishna Murari Prabhu. Prabhuji, thank you for the amazing class. My, just an introspection, I was wondering... You said one law which goes on for years. We have thousands of laws for thousands of subjects. So only Supreme Personality of Godhead could have written such a law, which is one law for so much, entire millenniums and millenniums after. So that point has really struck me and how amazing this law could be. We have law which changes every month in India practically. There is an <laughs> amendment brought on every month. There is no amendment to this law over the ages. So amazing point, Roji. I really Bhagavan. appreciate that. Thank you so much, bro. Thank you. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. How much uh, we think we, why can, why is this happening to me? Law of karma and this and that. We do not have the brains to understand simple law of this land. Let alone understand, we cannot keep it consistent either, as you are saying. And then we think, oh, why we cannot understand law of karma? So, gahana karmano gatihi. Thank you, Prabhuji. All right. No more questions. Thank you very much for attending. And we will see you all next Friday. That's correct. Yeah. Next Friday, we will see you same time, same place. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Srila Prabhupad ki jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Thank you Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you Prabhuji. Thank you. Thank you Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. I'm recording. More and more, if you into it, better meanings, Prabhuji. What? More what? and more, if we start listening to this, sorry, more and more, if we are into do you more and more, I get deeper and better answers. Yes, that's correct. Mahatma Gandhi also says the same thing. <laughs> We read that quote last time. So yes, you are absolutely right. I 100% agree with you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Today's class was very nice. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.